Patrick will emerge from his lair. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for coming out on the Monday after the Tucson Festival of Books. And we're so delighted that both Sujata and Stephen Mac Jones were in Tucson and therefore able to steam up here to Scottsdale to see us. So thank you, virtual audience, for joining us. And we're here to talk about books in series tonight. So I guess an interesting question to ask you both. Um, uh, Sujata, this is your second or third series because we started out in Japan. Yeah, it's my second series. Right, but you have, you're on, I think, aren't you? Yeah, it's no, you're fine. Okay. Right, um, what is, what draws you to a series? Stephen City's first series, right? So, yes. right, so mm -hmm. that part we can ask. But, you know, after you wrote the, the um, wonderful series set in Japan, which is where we first met you, um, there was kind of a lull. Yeah, thank, thanks so much, Barbara, for <laughs> the kind words. And yeah, there was a lull. I had um, shifted. I decided I wanted to write about a place that I was more likely to be going and engaged in. And that country was India, which I'm, I'm half Indian, so it's part of my heritage. Uh, and I was doing a lot of things with my children that... Um, were were tied to Indian culture. Like I was doing things with my kids that I didn't have so much of an experience doing myself as a child and that I wanted them to have. And so then just the more that my circle, the more Indian my circle became, and it, we also had moved to the Twin Cities where my parents live, So and they are both remarried, so all of a sudden they had three Indian grandparents and one uh, German. Mm -hmm. So it, it just became, that just became my new country somehow. And well, I wanted to write about sense. India. And then uh, I think the other part of your question is, why do you write series instead of standalones? And I get very, um, I get very tied to my characters mm -hmm. and I fall in love with them and I get very interested in their families and, you know, heaven help me if there's a small romantic interest because then... You want to, people want to see that romantic interest again. So it's that I become part of that world, you know, where I just get so invested in that world, I want to keep writing about it. Oh. As a reader, I do too. I love them. How about you, Stephen? What is doing? Because this is August Snow, what number, f which one is it? Uh, this is the uh, fourth, fourth August Snow. And it's funny because uh, we writing series. Um, those of us out there, writers who are out there who write standalones, are envious of us, the, uh, the folks that write series, and I find myself envious of those who write standalones. And in talking with these folks, it seems like... Uh, Nothing makes us happy. <laughs> uh, the uh, grass nothing. is always green. Yeah, but you, you can write it both. Is. Have I mean, you ever met a screenwriter? Because the screenwriters all want to be writing novels, and we all want to be writing yes. movies. Yes. <laughs> well, a perfect example of that is uh, Joe Ide. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Joe started writing, from what I know, um, started out writing uh, film scripts. And uh, did rather well with that. Um, but nothing was ever produced. Mm. So he started feeling like, I need to see, feel, touch, hold mm -hmm. my work. Um, I can't just send it off to the ethers. Uh, and that's when he started uh, the IQ series. Which is wonderful, by the way. It's wonderful, but you could go way back. Sue Grafton and Thomas Perry both started out oh, writing yes. film scripts, yes. you know, mm -hmm. so it's not... We've heard lots of, of people who've come from movies to books and extol the freedom of writing a novel as not by committee, you know. Um, but on the other hand, it's harder because the stuff that the sets and the actors put into a film script, you now have to yes. write them as an author, yes. you know. Um, so... 
But I think, you know, you could write both. There are plenty of people who write series and then write standalones. Michael yes. Connolly's done that, all kinds of people. So mm-hmm. if you're absolutely smitten with an idea that doesn't fit your guy. Well, does anybody remember um, the A-Team? Yeah. Uh, and uh, several other shows that Stephen J. Cannell did, who was, who was wonderful. Um, Stephen J. Cannell quit that business, which he was very successful at, uh, to write novels, and he did very well there. But there was a personal yeah. reason for that. He was dyslexic, and he wanted to. We had him I here many know. times. I was very fond of Stephen, yeah. uh, and part of the reason he wanted to write books was to kind of triumph over the dyslexia. You know, yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, he was a lovely guy. Remember, Patrick? We were lucky to have him here for so many times. Yeah. He would fly in on his jet to the Scottsdale airport, and then he would invite me up for lunch on his plane. <laughs> so it was great. Wow. I know. He was. He was <laughs> and he was still married when he died uh, to his eighth grade sweetheart. They'd been together almost their entire lives, seriously. So now he was he was a lovely guy. But anyway, um, so another part of a series that has always appealed to me is the location. So we've talked about Ray Shimura in Japan, and I, I, I love those, but I'm finding that getting used to Bombay in the 1920s is a fascinating thing. And I made my first trip ever to Detroit last fall. Mm. Uh, did you enjoy it? I did. Good. I did. We were actually cruising the Great Lakes, and we came down the river from Canada, you know, past yes. Detroit, sailed into Detroit. It has a beautiful harbor when you sail in on the yes. river and then departed for Lake Erie and Cleveland, which I'd never also visited, so it was kind of fun. You heard it here first. Mm-hmm. You know, nobody got killed. Okay, so we're right. proud of that. Right, well, Stephen pointed out, when, when, when we had an event with Stephen a while back, Stephen pointed out that the most porous border that we have is actually around Detroit, and it's with Canada, not with Mexico, yes. uh, and how difficult it is to patrol the waterways and so forth. And so Detroit, yes. you know, we, we tend to look south at our border all mm-hmm. the time, and we forget that we have a very long northern border as well. Yes. Nearly 100 trillion gallons of water surrounding Michigan. Um, plus, it's only been maybe 10 years 10, 15 years since a tunnel from uh, Windsor underneath uh, the Detroit River to Detroit was closed. Um, And there was a time when um, workers that were, migrant workers that were flown at the invitation of uh, the Canadian government flown to take care of the crops in Canada um, found themselves heading south through that uh, tunnel, walking through that tunnel. The, the power of the American dream. One of the great reasons to read mysteries is all the fun stuff you learned that you would absolutely <laughs> yeah. never come across in any other way. Right. So uh, why don't we, uh, why don't you each give us a little um, summation of your book, and then you guys should take off and talk about whatever you want. Okay. So talking about, you know, porous boundaries and neighborhoods, you know, the, the um, city of Bombay, it really, it's a, it's a series of islands. And back in the 1920s, some of them were linked with bridges, some of them were, were not, and um, it's only today that you can drive pretty much continuously for a lot of, through a lot of places. But in this book, in the 1920s, there's, um, there's a, north, a northern um, village called Ghatkopar, which had been like indigenous uh, Marathi-speaking Indians lived there, but as People flooded into Bombay for business reasons. There were people from Guj- this neighboring um, province of Gujarat that were very successful. And once they had made their money, they had lived in very squalid conditions in the heart of the city 
once they had made their money, they said, oh, we want to live somewhere that's clean and pretty, so we're going to start living in this village. And then the, there was this um, train built out, you know, a train way to go there. And so I'm exploring that neighborhood, which today is a very, still very densely Gujarati, but it really does feel like the city. But it, it's a, it, you know, I'm looking at it. What, what does it mean to be part of this conservative community that's also very successful in business? And my heroine, Perveen Mystery, goes to a party at the start of the book. It's very classic cozy. It's actually a tea party. And the, the Gujarati ladies are fundraising to start a maternity hospital because the condition of, you know, women and children dying was very, very high at that time. And they, there wasn't a lot of use of hospitals in, even if you wanted to use a hospital, it, it wouldn't have been near you. So they're trying to build a hospital. There's a terrible accident at the party and that draws Perveen into this group. And then there, there is a, there is a murder mystery. And then there's also some stuff going on with reproductive rights. So I think I, I cover this neighborhood, Got Copra. I cover South Bombay, which is where, if you've ever been to India, you know, these are places where the, the Taj Hotel is and, you know, all these beautiful um, buildings that are, are famous, these very grand buildings. And that's sort of where the seat of the um, power was, the seat of British power in, in Mumbai. So for anybody who hasn't read your books before, tell us a little bit about Praveen because she's a real groundbreaking um, person. Yeah, I that's like that's a good point. Uh, so I write about the same protagonist and she's a young woman solicitor. She's 24 years old and her name is Praveen Mystery. Mystery, yes, it's a play on words and it's a common surname for her community who are the Indian Zoroastrians who are called Parsis there. So Praveen manages to get to study law in Britain at Oxford, and she is a lawyer's daughter, and she is sort of a tribute to the first two women lawyers in India, um, Cornelius Sarabji and Mitantata Lam, who are also sort of in uh, Bombay and the area near it. And there had been women working in law in India, if you count Cornelius, since 1890. And that is really, it, it's a little known fact. And these early women lawyers had really um, a very strong social conscience and did a lot of work with um, clients, female clients who were not permitted by their families to see men, so they couldn't get legal representation from a male lawyer. So that was where they stepped in. Right. So what what era are we in? Well, I'm. This is 1920s, and I picked that era because I wanted to have a time when a woman could be working as a solicitor, but she was not yet able to be a barrister. And a barrister, I know you're a former lawyer. Oh, right? We have a distinct, we don't make this distinction, right, but solicitors do all the civil and business and real estate stuff, and barristers are the are the people in court with their fancy wigs and, yeah. you know, all of that, um, and the, the British definitely make a distinction. If you're a barrister, you're called to the bar, because there is a bar in the courtroom. If you're a solicitor, I don't believe that you have to be. No, and, and even though that, you know, like, sort of I think that the the popular image of the glamour in law is the person who makes that passionate argument. In India, the person who makes more money and has more status actually is the solicitor. That's probably <laughs> probably true in British law as well. Um, unfortunately, they they can't change roles. But what I've always thought was really interesting is that barristers can be hired by either the prosecution or the defense. Most of the time in this country, people are either prosecutors or they're defense lawyers, but rarely, in fact, only in Michael Connolly books am I aware. Uh, Harry once went over, no, Mickey Haller once went over to help um, prosecute a case with um, um, Harry Bosch, and Harry now is sort of working for the defense bar, but it doesn't normally sort out that way. But in England, the barristers are for hire. Yeah. You know, <laughs> so it, um, 
they're they're not i don't know maybe it's maybe it's juster in the sense that they um they don't have to maintain yeah. you know a particular clientele if they're just there for hire yeah and i i deal with that barristers for hire in this book because there's a situation where, where a young woman is being charged with a crime and it's it's actually has something to do with reproduction and so the the no man wants to touch this case so Perveen spends all this time trying to get a barrister throughout the book and she doesn't know what she's going to do because she's promised this woman that she's going to help her <laughs> well let's switch up to the 21st century over here um and i love this book dsx because it starts in norway um, and our, it turns out that our, our guy, Augustus, is commuting back and forth between Oslo and Detroit. So, but let's go back to the beginning for people who don't know your books. Why don't you okay. explain to us who Augustus is, et cetera? Uh, August Snow, August Octavio Snow, is um, half black, half Mexican-American. Uh, he's a former Marine and uh, an ex-Detroit cop. And the important part of that is X, um, because he was fired from the Detroit police force for investigating uh, the mayor's office. <laughs> wow, what a stretch that is for Detroit. <laughs> so, yeah, right? Um, well, he sued and he won uh, $12 million uh, in a wrongful dismissal suit. That's a lot of money, but at what cost? And that is what has has concerned him for a long time. Uh, he loved police work, and to be hounded out like that is an embarrassment to him, and he felt an embarrassment to his father, who was a Detroit cop. Um, August moves back to uh, his family home in a section of Detroit called Mexican Town. And Mexican Town, which is really uh, southwest Detroit, uh, has been around for 120 years. Um, all he wants to do is live a quiet life and um, revitalize the street that he lives on, taking the money that he won and revitalizing the street that he lived on. Um, however, August gets pulled into uh, various and sundry um, situations. Uh, he doesn't seek out uh, any of these situations. Um, but the first was uh, the first book, August Snow. Um, he gets pulled into a situation of organized criminals um, taking offshore money and bringing it on American shores uh, through the acquisition of smaller banks, uh, credit unions, et cetera, and so forth. Um, so um, that's a little bit about August, but the character is also reflected in um, his neighbors, um, his friends. Um, he lives next door to um, two older ladies that um, retired from, uh, I believe, um, Detroit Water Department. Just really good friends. And they didn't want to end up living with their kids and babysitting because, you know, they had spent their life, you know, supporting their men, cooking meals, raising children. They feel it's their time. Um, so those are his neighbors. 
and the cautionary word there is never eat their brownies. <laughs> um, uh, they take in a young Native American girl from the Upper Peninsula who is a um, computer wizard and not always in the right way. And uh, who else? There is his godmother and godfather. Uh, Elena Gutierrez is a lovely woman. Um, give you give you the blouse off her back, uh, helps people the whole shot, shows up at city council meetings advocating for Mexican town. And her husband, um, Tomas, um, August Godfather, um, he, he has a pretty well-stocked gun locker in his basement. Um, he's He's a good second gun to have, and he's a very good godfather, and he will, he always tells you the truth, no matter how hurtful it can be. He knows no other way. Uh, so that's that's a little so bit. So where does the Norwegian sweetheart, the reason for ah. the commute, where does she come from? Uh, Probably not next door. <laughs> no, no. Um, August's sweetheart is named Tatina Stadmuller. She's half Somali, uh, half German. And August met her prior to, that's a bit of his backstory. Um, he met her after winning this settlement of $12 million and trying to drink himself to death through, you know, Southeast Asia, Europe, et cetera, and so forth, and met her in uh, Norway. And uh, she helped get him on the straight path. So they have this long distance relationship, but he describes it like, um, what is, what is it, what's that interaction where two molecules uh, connect for a, a bit and then one molecule can go a hundred million miles one direction, another molecule will go the other direction, but there's always a link if one starts rotating um, an opposite way, the other one will start rotating an opposite way. Um, For a person who watched Oppenheimer, wouldn't you think I could answer that? Yeah, but yeah. Um, <laughs> I know, it's really kind of embarrassing. I'm trying to remember what it is called, but uh, isn't that Einstein, what the colliders do? Yeah, um, Einstein called it something with spooky action. He wasn't really a fan of that physics theory, um, but it's just been proving, proven correct. So Augustus is, um, I, I, I keep conflating his name, August, <laughs> and I, I keep calling him Augustus. It's actually just August. Um, he's in Norway when DSX starts yes. and gets word that something has happened. That It's amazing how fast you can travel the world now, isn't it? He can get it, back it to Detroit. It truly is. It truly really, is. what, probably one stop in, what, yep, just Newark or something or Boston? Right. Right. Did readers know he was in Norway at the end of the preceding book? Uh, no, they did not. Um, because in my world, <laughs> he hadn't gone yet. Ah. And um, uh, that's, a, that's a great question because I, I can't recall exactly why I started the book in Norway, yeah. I wanted, I guess I wanted to show that he had a life outside of Detroit and mm -hmm. his relationship with Tatina was true and good. 
and she just kind of pulls him into this Norwegian situation. Yeah, and he even meets her mother. Yes, yes. So I love that part. <laughs> but he I mean, starts this book as an outsider, right? Uh, because yes. he's, he's not there when the action is happening in Detroit. He's summoned back. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and what brings him back is the illness of uh, one of the two ladies that uh, I mentioned earlier. Um, if nothing else, he he will not admit it, but he does so terribly love uh, the neighbors on his street. Um, so, yeah. It's not fission. Is that fission? Nuclear? No, no, it's fusion not fission. fission. Fusion, fission. It's quantum physics, yes. Um, mm. Which is all of that theoretical Some, stuff. Somebody will write in and answer the question, yes. Patrick. Just pay mm -hmm. attention yes. <laughs> to the Facebook audience. Right. So one of the themes that seemed to me that was common to your books, aside from the R series and they are in interesting locations, um, is um, oppression that, you know, we're dealing with, uh, or maybe the word is suppression. I'm not entirely mm -hmm. sure. You have picked up on things happening in the Catholic Church, for example, and victims of that. Um, and Sujata is forever dealing with, um, yes. you know, women's rights and um, women who are trying for agency but have not, you know, s have not completely yeah. gotten it. So, you know, do you think that, that those messages in your, not messages, do you think that those enrich your books when you're not just, you know, pursuing a bank robber or something, but you're actually talking about all kinds of things? Um, uh, yes, and I think, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Sujata, um, I think we are taking the struggles of a period of time, uh, a place in the world, um, that struggles that are really not secret but showing uh, an intimate cost, an intimate struggle against those um, trials and tribulations, if you will. Yeah, um, I know that there was a tremendous um, difference in the way people lived and died in India during this time. Like they were, there was a big rise in mortality for women from about age 15 to probably the late 30s. And this is the childbearing period. And so it was, you know, quite common for women to have really bad complications because they were having babies at home and sometimes they were very young. And if you had a woman, say, who lived in an environment where she wasn't able to leave her home, like if she lived in Parda, um, and she was really restricted to her home and she got married. So she didn't have a lot of light and she was married at an age like nine or 10 and say she started having babies around 11 or 12. The bones are softer. She's much more likely to have a very messy, painful, you know, potentially fatal delivery of a child. And you know what? It took a woman OBGYN to start talking about that and there was there actually was the first Indian woman OBGYN there is was Dr. Jerusha Gerard and she was a Indian woman Jewish Indian woman and I have a character in my book Miriam Penker who's kind of like a fictionalization of her and so she, we can talk about those same issues um, and of course, there were some really strong laws. There were no laws about abortion and certainly nothing about birth control before the British came. Mm -hmm. And they were quite lenient rules in the beginning, but in the um, starting in the 1860s, the laws became very strict and, um, you know, mm -hmm. that people could be convicted um, in cases of abortion, although, it was usually men who were um, called up and arrested if, there, if a woman had died. If somebody had died and they could, say, prove that 
she'd been given something by someone else they would be put in jail. So, and the, and also this whole idea of abortion was used as a way to threaten people and expose them. And so I deal with that. And I, I was really fortunate that um, there's a wonderful um, scholar of Indian colonial law, Dr. Mitra Sharafi at the University of Wisconsin. And she checks my work for me. Um, I really, because I'm not a lawyer and I'm writing mysteries about a lawyer and I, I like to send my work to her and it, she had just happened to write a really long treatise on how abortion law was used um, and also the status of birth control at that time and I was able to use mm. that. I would never have pulled it off if there hadn't been scholarship already to, to be a guide. But here's, here's the thing, here is... Uh uh, this is what I think is a great part of your genius, and I hope I'm <laughs> walking in y your wake, oh. um, is with the reality of these issues, um, Sujata has created uh, um, characters that are flesh and blood uh, with backstories that are human um uh, not um fully human and that means the the triumphs and failures are mm -hmm. there as they try to walk a true north path um or or live a life that they see is possible um so i th i i think that is is a great part of of the brilliance that you bring to your series um and like i said i'm i i just hope i'm you know skiing oh, behind come you. on well, you know. well i th that's it's re really kind what you're saying and I mean, one of the, the really big things, I think, for both of us in our work is we cannot bend the law to suit our, our, our happy endings. We can never do that. Right. And so there are going to be guys that get away with things, and they're not going to go to jail. There are going to be women that go, don't go to jail yes. because they're, I mean, you know, basically to be a white person in Britain, it's a pretty, uh, pretty high bar you would have to cross to actually get in jail. You, you know, you might lose your job, yeah. but you'd probably not go to jail. So um, there, there are all these these things that you and I are both dealing with, and I think we're we're very fortunate to be at this a publishing house that cares about stories yes. about the little person or the forgotten person. Yes, our characters don't all look like they come off in you know ABC legal drama. You know, <laughs> they look like that or. Or CSI or something, you know that we can yeah. really we can just be more realistic and yes, and and um, I think that is also a part of the beauty of what we do and what we try to achieve uh, in telling stories uh, concerning people that. Um, have not been seen uh, for a long time is is f first of all we're showing um, uh, well black people Mexican people Indian people that that uh, we see them uh, we're telling we're trying to tell their stories and for those people that are not those minorities, it's it's a wonderful way of seeing the world around you, learning the world around you, um, going to places that you've never been before, uh, and and having experiences that you've never had before. So, um, 
I don't think I don't think I'm sitting here saying, yeah, man, only black people and Mexicans can read this. No, I no. Um, uh, there's. <laughs> And these are multiracial worlds that yes, we're writing about, exactly, too. It's, exactly. you know, Praveen, this, this British colonial system was there for a long time. And there are some dear, you know, Praveen has this dear friend, Alice Hobson Jones, yes. who she spends a, a lot of time with. And Alice's parents are absolutely horrible, you know, and, and that she's, they, they are a threat to Praveen. They're a threat yes. to their friendship. But they're still working it through. Yes. And I, I, I love to be able to tell stories like that and to find people that are discovering yes. truth for themselves. Exactly. That's different from the party line. Yes. Yes. Um, uh, you, may, you may hit me on the head with uh, your microphone. Um, <laughs> and that's okay. I gonna... That's okay, too, because I've been married for 30 years. I have so many welts, <laughs> <laughs> but um, in some ways, and, and I haven't read uh, the last two books of yours, mm -hmm. but in some ways, um, your series takes me back to, oh, there was a PBS series a long time ago that started naturally from BBC mm -hmm. uh, called uh, The Jewel and the Crown. Mm -hmm. Do you remember yes, that I do. series? Yes, I do. Uh, and such such an atmosphere, such you bring forth um, such a living atmosphere, uh, such a living environment. Um, it's, it's easy to see. Well, let's talk really? about how we do that because you do that too with your city, Patrick. Excuse so, me, could you I mean, turn the way the I, what I do, is I go there. I don't. I'm not lucky enough to live there, but I go there. I, I try to go into a lot of different buildings, yes. old buildings, and I spend. You know, th this neighborhood, God Coper, that I write about, this Gujarati neighborhood. I have, uh, you know, a cousin who lives there, so I spend time in her neighborhood with her okay. and with her friends. Yes. So I, I like to just kind of bury myself as much as I can in these places. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons that I chose to write about Bombay, now Mumbai, versus other big cities in India is there has been some really good historic preservation there. Oh. I mean, let's okay. face it, there's more money there. And okay. so, and they also realized that this was very valuable. So there's been really good preservation, and you can go into, yes. you know, old hotels and old government buildings and um, old cafes, and it's it's a very very delightful experience. Now the real claim to fame for um, Bombay is in the 1930s they had this gigantic Art Deco building boom and it's all over the city and it's particularly near the water and I'm just a little too early for that and once I wrote in an art deco building and my agent noticed right away and she said that only came about after the world's fair so I I reluctantly took that building out though I really wanted yeah, to put I, it in there you know I I I have a similar experience okay uh in the I believe the second August Snow Lives Laid Away. Um, I was writing about uh, the decrepit, um, decaying uh, train station uh, mm -hmm. on Michigan Avenue in Detroit, a building that had been abandoned for over 30 years, uh, stripped of its wiring. Uh, of its glass windows, mm -hmm. uh, everything, everything. It was just uh, this giant corpse on Michigan Avenue. And I wrote a fight scene there, and I'm feeling proud. Mm -hmm. I'm saying, oh, 
<laughs> this is the best. And outside of the train station was um, a park. It was like a couple uh, acre park. And nobody went there because it was essentially Needle Park. And if you were homeless, it was um, where you relieved yourself, et cetera, and so forth. So I finish, I finish this fight scene at the train station. And a couple days later, a week later, Ford Motor Company announces, we've bought the building and we're going to revitalize it. Was, oh, mm. Guys, couldn't you have waited another year? Uh. Um, so I, I had to uh, revise that just a little bit um, as Ford was uh, sending the first crews in um, to look at what needed to be done. Nowadays, the train station, it's beautiful, just beautiful. Mm -hmm. And the park out front, it's, I don't know what they did with all the poor people. <laughs> well, there you go. Um, but it's, it's unrecognizable. Um, but yeah, that was... Um, well, how important is it? Like, do you feel it's really important when someone picks up your book that it's 2024? Or would you feel comfortable saying like, oh, this is actually 2021, and so it could be like this? Um, I really don't get caught up in um, calendar years. Um, I, I want people to know it's generally the present day. Um, I'll tell you where calendar years do make an impact. Um, I'm thinking that this series has a life of maybe six to seven books. Mm -hmm. And that's primarily because um, I've seen what happens when characters continue. Mm -hmm. um, these days, um, Robert B. Parker Spencer is probably uh, 98 years old. Um, if you go from the God Wolf manuscript uh, chronologically through. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't want to do that. Um, I also, I also want August to find his way out into another life, into a new life. Um, as, as regular people often do. Um, so that's, that's the only chronology that that's really important to me i find it really refreshing to hear you talk like that about d saying a series has a finite amount of of books or you feel the story has a finite amount i've been feeling that way too not necessarily that i know an, a number yeah. but i know right. i don't see it being 20 books Right. I just don't see myself writing 20 books. And I'll be curious to hear from the audience when we're getting questions and comments about whether they feel that series have, like, usually the first 10 books are good, usually yes. the first five books yes. are good, or what, what they feel about right. it. And would you forgive somebody if they wanted to write a new series or a standalone? <laughs> yeah, and I was I was going to say, here's here's the morbid twist to what we're saying. Mm -hmm. If we die and our kids say, hey, you know, um, we got a good offer from XYZ Publishing to bring August back, um, I, I, I have to get some paperwork 
together for my three kids. Yeah. You need, really you need, need a, a literary, literary executor. Yeah. I'm yes. working yeah. on that. <laughs> I've got my eye on certain young ladies, some of my do- my uh, friends' daughters that I that I have like I have like a little list of them in the back of my mind, but I better do it before it's too late. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Cuz I don't think my husband could could manage it. You know, it's like I don't think that he would he would want the best for me, but I don't think he could follow somebody that wasn't intimately connected with the series right right but you know that there's somebody out there who after you pass on is going to approach your loved ones and say you know you're setting on a lot of money uh-huh. <laughs> no i mean it i mean it there's <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> Movies, TV, uh, internet. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Even more dangerous <laughs> now that we have AI. Even more dangerous. Oh yes. And oh, fan yeah. fiction. Yes. You know, I often remind people that Fifty Shades of Grey was just fan fiction for Twilight. Oh yeah. 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 My goodness. You didn't know mm-hmm. that? No. No, I, mean, I, I knew. Yeah, yeah. but yeah. I mean, you know, it's very easy. So Sushad is entirely right. You need a literary estate and a literary yes. executor who can spurn. Barbara will help us. <laughs> oh, no. Barbara, you've got to live forever. <laughs> well, but what I do do is I actually advise authors about this a lot. In, uh-huh. You know, dinner conversations and all, it does come up, you know. Do you yes. really want someone else to keep writing your work? Now, I have to say that in many cases, we talk to authors who are, in fact, writing in the footsteps of other authors. I was yes. just asked today. Yes. I already know it's Tuesday, September 3rd, um, that Don Bentley will bring the first Vince Flynn follow-up that he's writing now that Kyle Mills has retired. And so for fans of Vince Flynn, who died too soon and who really liked those characters, you know, and who left a young family who undoubtedly, you know, appreciate the financial support, that's a good thing. And it's a very personal decision, I think, that every author has to make you know do you want that to happen and i agree with you that that it's being uh, there are certain characters that have lived their life with the original author who've moved on and are being represented by brilliant uh, authors um ace atkins did it with spencer uh, he, and he's he, coming here at the end of June with his uh, new book. I'm really excited you know, about that, that. That man has been so kind to me. Um, Lovely guy, isn't he's, he? He's just brilliant. He's wonderful. Um, and this is this is from somebody from that, you know, sets in an overstuffed leather chair at home, and my wife will say what do you say we go to this restaurant and get out with some people? No, it's, it's too people-y. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm always, I'm always um, fascinated and, and, and grateful for uh, warm, good people like Ace Atkins, uh, like Mike Lupica, um, mm-hmm. uh, Hank, Philippe Ryan. Um, just it's a very, it's a very supportive community. Yes. there's very little yes. rivalry within the Karen the community. Yeah, it's wonderful. So one of the things that when I asked you about oppression, it occurred to me that um, what you're both really good at is writing about individuals and um, the things that people do to each other. But you're also really writing about institutional, you know, harm. Um, Colonial Britain, Catholic Church, and these two books, whatever it might be. And I like that, that you're writing about both the macro and the micro at the same time. Yeah. You know, some injuries we cause each other, but some of them are caused by larger, yeah. shapes, you know. Yeah. Uh, and that, that's an interesting thing, I think, to, um, to balance in your books. Well, uh, as far as far as this book goes, um, Deus Ex, um, I wrote it with a good deal of trepidation because I am Catholic. Uh, my wife is Catholic Catholic. <laughs> um, 
but there were so many things that were happening uh, in the world with Catholicism that I couldn't bottle these things up, and it became um, an explore, exploration for me of what is faith and what is religion. Um, and that was, that was um, August's turmoil in this book is partially my own, uh, without the guns or blood. Uh, yeah, you're safe in your leather chair. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yes. It, and Sujata, um, one of the things I love about this series is the Zoroastrianism, the Parsis, um, because, you know, we, we think of India mostly in terms of Hindu and, you know, then yeah. the Pakistani, that, that whole divide, but there are many subcultures within the Indian continent. Yeah, there are, there are a lot of um, people with different religions in India. You know, there are Christians, there are Muslims, Hindus, Sikhs, uh, Jews, um, and the Zoroastrians, and I do not have a Zoroastrian connection. Mm. The reason that I write a Praveen mystery as a Zoroastrian lawyer is because they dominated the profession in Bombay at the turn of the century. Even though they were just 3% of the population, they made up a third to half of the city's lawyers. And all the early women lawyers were either Zoroastrian or had a like a Zoroastrian connection. For example, the, somebody was Zoroastrian but converted to Christianity. So I felt I, I could I had to give this community credit for being the ones who had these yes. who who gave the women the chance in their community, and they were really proud of them. They liked women to be the first. The first woman lawyer, the first, for example, the first woman doctor, though there were Hindus that got in on that. So um, the, so that's why I write about that community. But that has been challenging for me because it is not my faith. I've been fortunate to make friends in that faith. And so now I have friends here in the United States, friends in India. And also I, I delved into the world, the different world of the Jewish communities within Bombay. And so I met somebody there who is an expert in that um, community. Well, she's a member of that community, and she's keeping the history. And yeah. now she's a good friend, too. So it's, it's like it enriches my world. Like the, the, sort of like going back and finding things that are in danger of being lost. There's always going to be somebody who loves that and wants to talk about it and is willing to share with us. Yes. Don't you think? Yes, yeah. absolutely. Um, you touched on uh, the friends that you've made during the course of uh, writing this series. Um, I, I, I've I've made some friends too, um, but in it's often been in an odd way. The oddest was. Uh, Oh, God, about eight months, a year ago, um, Mary-Kate and I, my wife and I, are downtown uh, Eastern Market. We're at a place called um, Vivio's. Oh, oh a menu, a, a menu as long as your leg of... of uh, different types of Bloody Marys. Just incredible. Well, um, I believe the third book had come out, and I had mentioned Vivio's mm -hmm. uh, in the book. So we're down, we're having a great dinner, a um, couple of Bloody Marys, and this waiter comes up to me and says, are you, are you Steve Jones, Stephen Mac Jones? I said, yes, I am. You know, thinking it was an autograph moment. <laughs> and the waiter said, Vince wants to talk with you. <laughs> Vince is the owner. 
mm-hmm. I've never I, I've never met Vince. You didn't ask for permission. That's huh. that's what I was thinking. Uh. <laughs> so maybe a a month later we're down there and um I s- nervously said is is Vince in? Like, yeah. Who can I tell him is asking? Uh, Steve Jones, Stephen Mike Jones. Oh yeah, you him. Yeah, let me get Vince. <laughs> like, oh God, I'm I'm gonna be shot in front of my wife. <laughs> um, so Vince comes out, uh-huh. and he comes over to the table. And he says, uh, you're the guy who wrote about my restaurant in your book, right? I said, yes, yes I am. To our waiter. They don't pay for nothing. <laughs> Enjoy. And that was it. And it was like, I don't, I don't think I have an appetite now, honey. <laughs> oh, that is crazy. But uh, yeah, it was it was nuts. Yeah, um, I'm nervous about the police. Like that, those are the kind of things that I don't really want to be. Like I I need to learn about pol- police procedure, but I don't want to come too close to the police. Right. So it's a right. very difficult dance. How do you handle that? Um, I have talked to a couple of cops, Detroit cops and uh, cops in the community I live Mm -hmm. in, uh, Farmington Hills. And two of those cops have read uh, drafts of um, the August Snow series, and their response has been laughter. It's like, yeah, you don't know how close you hit it, man. Oh. And it's like, really? I'm... uh, you're okay with this? He said, oh, oh yeah. It's like, okay. Ooh. So, um, at least, at least I know if I get yeah. pulled over for something, there's a couple guys. Yeah, I can... you got it. You... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do you guys want to ask questions from the audience? Yes, yes. yes. Do you have questions for us? <laughs> oh yeah, I know. I pulled him away. My wife and I we were born there, grew up there, went to high school there. Uh, live about. Oh, sorry. No, that's all right. Live, live about live about three miles in Huntington Woods, outside of Detroit. I just retired from a big law firm in downtown Detroit. Uh, and. I used to work for the former head of the FBI in Detroit, oh. so I know police procedures. <laughs> <laughs> so, and she's the head of security at our synagogue, or mm-hmm. part of that. And wow. and there's so much of the history that you. First of all, I think that writing about the history and giving the characters a backstory is why you would read the second book, because there are a lot of people who you don't need to when they don't get into who your characters are, where they come from, why you know. Why bother? So it's great. I have two. I have the next stories for you. You just, you know, there's a, there's a <laughs> dilapidated building called the uh, Southwest YMCA. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I yes. used to, I used to represent Eastern Market, so we'll talk about that ah, later. So. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, I l- love your books. Love. Uh, haven't read your books yet, but will promise. Yeah. Starting tonight, if she agrees. Yeah. Um, and and we, you know, we love it. I've read. All of your books, I wish I remembered them as well as you do, but I can't say that I do, but I'll, I'll do better with them going forward. So thank you for coming. Thank you for hosting these. These are, these are. Thanks for coming all the way from Detroit. We flew in tonight. In fact, we have, no. <laughs> no we, we spend winters here. We, we, <laughs> oh, yeah, we do. Mm-hmm. So. so how did you, so one question then, yes. since you talked to a couple of cops, how did you originally get the source? of some of your writing in Detroit? Uh, I got the source because it was reported over the the period of six months in the free press. Uh, 
the things that happened uh, in the mayor's office. Um, we knew the wife of the detective who was uh, a former Marine and a decorated uh, detective lieutenant um, who actually did investigate the mayor's office. And um, Mary Kate, we were at, this is, this is a while ago, we were at the uh, same software company uh, when this was going on. And uh, the wife of the detective lieutenant um, really, really fantastic lady, um, strong as all get out, smart as all get out. Um, she was breaking down at the office um, because of what was going on with her husband uh, and the pressure from the mayor's office. Uh, so a lot of, of what I came to know um, came from that situation uh, and represented the Detroit of that period, uh, that recent period. Um, but Anyone yeah. else? I can pass the mic around if you have a question. Come on, guys. Oh, good. Well, Patrick, then you want... Okay, let's see here. Yeah, okay, well, here's a deep question for you, Stephen. Um, let's see. Have you learned, have you indeed learned what is faith and what is religion from writing this book, or are you still working on that? That's that's a great question, whoever. It was Renee, our friend Renee. Hi, Renee. Um, I'm still working on that. Um, my faith is um, vacillates between uh, being Christian, uh, Jewish, and Universalist, with with some Zen Buddhism mixed in, and I don't think they have a home for that yet. Um, yeah. So I'm I'm still learning, still seeking. Let's see. There uh, for for Sujata, the person here. I I lost the question, but it was. Um, have you spent much time in Bombay, or have you ever lived there? I've been visiting there since 2009, so I've never had the chance to live there. I was most recently in India. For, well, I was in India twice between October and the and the end of February. So I made two separate trips and it's it feels like I'm kind of flirting with staying longer and longer and longer, but I I miss my home, I miss, you know, my family and my dog and everything. Is it expensive? Here. It depends on how you do it. I think you could do it pretty inexpensively, but I like to be comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> So I do, I highly recommend going. I think it's a wonderful place to visit. And India often has a bad rap as being a place that is, you're going to see a whole lot of poverty and it's, it's going to be hectic and it won't be well organized. And the fact is the hospitality is the, there is just absolutely superb um, almost everywhere that you stay. So it becomes a very in enjoyable place to stay and to eat and sleep. A few minutes ago, you said um, the Zoroastrian lawyer. Mm -hmm. I said, what a great title. Yeah, if I run out of saying things <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> the widows of Malabar Hill, right. I could say the Zoroastrian lawyer. Or at least but, because there are so many of them, yeah. yeah. There were, and they still are. Yeah, there still right? are a lot of them. Mm -hmm. Wow. A lot of firms that are Zoroastrian founded. 
Mm -hmm. So you know that um, in uh, Indira um, Gandhi's husband, his last name Gandhi, he was actually a Parsi, and that spelling was changed to make it look more like the Hindu um, Mahatma Gandhi. So uh, you'll see that name, G-H-A-N-D-Y. That's typically the Parsi spelling, and you will see it. There's a big law firm with that name, in fact. Well, um, there's an author named, is it Ronan Mystery? Have, or oh, Rohinton Mystery. Ro yeah, that's He's it. a fantastic um, fiction, uh, like a literary fiction author. Right. Yeah, right. Bopsy Sidwa is another um, Parsi author who's very, very successful. Let's see, anybody have questions? Or? No? Um, I know we've got to wrap. One more. Yeah. Real quick. I, you know, sorry to be. No, it's fine. It's no, sorry. Like you want yeah, to yeah. Sorry, but I just said <coughs> watching. So uh, we spend summers when we can in northern Michigan, and we go to a well known bookstore up there. and. One of the mystery writers in that area is Steve Hamilton, oh. um, who I, I he's mm -hmm. what been quiet for quite a long, right? But what he did has he been here? Really? So I've read all his earlier books. I can't remember a cop from Detroit, you know, who retired in the Upper Peninsula. But then he stopped and he wrote two other books about uh, his protagonist was a pretty nasty guy. <laughs> But the writing, his, uh, those were my two favorite books of his, and they were totally divorced from his earlier characters. And then, and then he's been quiet since, so I have Is no clue. Cool yes, yeah. Nick Mason. Th those were, hmm. I, I, I like those. Wasn't it the one about the locksmith? That was before. Yeah, it was. The lock artist. Yeah, the lock artist thesis, right. Yep. No, I didn't read that one. But anyway, that's so just an example of somebody who, who just picked a new character and wrote two books on that character without reference back to the other at all. So, Well, uh, oh, yes. No, go ahead. Um, I was just wondering, outside of, since we're on different um, genres, outside of mysteries, who are some authors that you all enjoy reading? I Let me jump in on that one, because I feel like reading outside of a genre is like my nutrition it, like it really really helps me i just read the covenant of water by abraham verghese and he was at the um festival too and so that was a huge moment for me actually seeing him and hearing him speak what a humble guy so, yeah he was a very very humble so he's a he's a physician who um went into medicine he wanted to write but it was sort of that medicine gave him the stories that he needed to tell and i really respect that that whole idea of your work bringing you to these stories and so this most recent novel was set in it's like a saga that spans 1900 through up through the 1970s i think in south india and kerala um so I I love that book. Um, so other non non mysteries. Hmm. That that's just like sticking in my mind right now. But I like I like Lisa C. I I really do like books that are sagas. I love books that are set overseas. Um, I also you know there there are things here. I like twisty things. That doesn't necessarily have to be a mystery, but I like. I like clever things. I like social novels, like um, satirical novels. Yeah. Um, at this time, I'm kind of revisiting some books that I've I've read before. Um, Elmore Leonard, um, and and not uh, Git Shorty or anything like that, but uh, 310 to Yuma, uh, his cowboy stuff. Um, also, Lauren D. Estelman, who wrote, uh, you know, the consummate Detroit detective series, 
but Amos Walker, but also wrote some of the best cowboy books ever. Uh, so I'm I'm rereading those. Um, I think the reason why uh, I'm going back to um, the American West, and by the way, Robert B. Parker wrote some uh, wonderful cowboy books, Appaloosa. Um, I'm I'm going back to those because for this book, uh, I read uh, three or four, maybe five books on the history of the Vatican, mm. and maybe uh, six books on um, on the Knights Templar, and that those books gave me the willies they just scared the bejesus out of me um i mean wonderful wonderful historical uh, non-fiction books but um it was it was just going down this rabbit hole and it was like oh, okay i got to pull out of this rabbit mm -hmm. hole and I got to get on the 310 to Yuma. <laughs> <laughs> when I look at some of that early kind of thing, because I've read a little bit in that same, that same vein, I, I feel like it almost points us toward horror in some <laughs> ways. And, you know, yeah. horror is becoming yeah. this big trend. And, in fact, our, our um, publisher is starting a horror imprint. Hell's Hundred. Hell's Hundred. You heard it here. So maybe that's our next stop. No, I, no. I I like to sleep at night. I yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. I, that's interesting that you can say that because when you have like some really scary stuff in your books, right? Scarier than me, I'd say between the two of us, you're way scarier than me. Um, but but do you like? Do, is it easy to write those scenes, or do you lose sleep and get scared? Um. Uh, I'll tell you something with this book. Um, before writing it, I, you know, I used to have a steady diet of news. And the news, whether it's uh, newspapers, uh, the radio, what have you, the internet, uh, your news feed on the internet, um, I really got uh, angry and depressed at how violent um, the country and the world had become. So I made it a conscientious decision to pull back mm. on the violence. And, and um, August makes the decision in... in a uh, particular situation to pull back on um, his proficiency for killing. Um, because, you know, it's... Um, if, you, if you look for darkness, you'll find it. You don't even have to look for it. Um, so... Um, yeah, some of the stuff that I, I write is, is pretty grim, um, but I can't go, uh, full black on black. Um, there has to be some humor, some joy, mm -hmm. something in there that reaffirms life. Well, th all those relationships that August has you know with these neighbors um people he loves and right. so that's so important and that actually that widens your audience i think i mean it's yes. you're doing it it's the way that you write but it's the way that somebody like me can enjoy it versus reading a, a book that's more just completely about scaring the reader or keeping right. them reading right. and shocking them Right. right. I don't right. I don't that's not why I'm reading. Like I'm reading for this 
immersive experience yes. that brings me something in the end. And, you know, if I can remember it so much, the better. Because, yes. I mean, honestly, not every mystery that I read, I can remember. Like, if you if you go back and ask me about an Agatha Christie and what exactly happened in that book, I, I could read it all over again. I forgot yes. Murder at the Orient Express. I yes. forgot, like, yes. the whole concept of it. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Is anybody else going to purchase? Thank you, folks. Right, so... Um, I did want to say that a little shout out for their publisher, Soho Press, which we have watched grow over the time that we have been here. And originally, they only published books that were set outside the United States. And then Alaska crept in, and I thought, okay, they're redefining foreign. <laughs> and now it's Detroit, which I think is even funnier. But um, the editor, Juliet uh, Grames, who is your overall editor at the press, is coming here on August 25th with Stuart Neville from Ireland, and he is opening up this new horror imprint, The Hell's Hundred. So I think it'll be really fun to have them here and to talk about this new venture, because you're right, Sujata, um, genre fiction, stuff goes up and down. And right now, horror and romanticy and so forth are, are very, very large. And, you know, they're a reaction in part to our times. Um, and historical fiction, for example, is much more comforting to read than contemporary fiction only because you know how it all came out, right? So it's, um, but you know, as the world turns and as people become over, oversaturated with a particular kind of book, remember the Da Vinci clones? There were like a zillion Da Vinci clones, right? Um, so you have to just sort of hang on and enjoy the ride when it comes, you know, yeah. spins at you and then recognize that things will change again. But, you know, I think that really solid crime fiction series or standalones will always have an audience regardless of what the trends are. So I thank you both for writing them. Thank, thank you, you for having the poison pen. Yeah, and thank that, you that, for that this us. home for books for all these years that, that I've been coming here and you've been coming yes. here and it's really marvelous to go into a store and to be able to buy every book the author has written. It's like complete, you know, that people could find my third book here. They could find your first book here. It's not just the latest thing. And I know you don't just send them back to the publishers after we leave town. No, we don't. <laughs> Thank so you. you. would, a hand for Barbara. Well, Thank you. Um, it's not me. It's the entire staff. You know, we're coming up on year 35. It's really hard to believe, isn't it, Patrick? I know. I sort of flinch when Longer I think about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, about the same as mine as it all happens. <laughs> anyway, um, the authors will stay here at this table, so if you want to come up and get a book signed or take a photo, please do. Thank you again for coming. Thank you, virtual audience. Have a safe trip home, those of you who drove down. So, And I do have, uh, how many of you are from Detroit? The two of you. Oh, good. Because on the table, if you'll hand it to me, is another book from Soho Press, and I'm giving it away tonight. And this is set in a little village in Italy. This is my advanced reading copy. So take it and enjoy it, and then you can pass it on to anyone you like. But we like to give we like to give a book away. Hmm? Uh, no, 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 no. Her new book isn't out until July. And it's that's someone I know. That's a wonderful yeah. woman who wrote that book. There's a ton of food in it. She It'll make you Italian. seriously hungry to read it. No, it, it's um, it's set in an Italian yeah. village, and I, it's a pleasure. Anyway, um, thank you all very much for coming. Good night. Do you remember when she was at Harper Collins? Yeah, because yeah, she had a different name then. She did have a different name. What is? Oh, I don't